So in that moment, I thought, well, this is my future. This man knows this thing about me. I'll never have to tell anyone else because I couldn't handle the shame of anyone knowing it about me. I'm going to stay with him where I'm safe and I won't just won't have to deal with this. So I really went into that relationship and into a big denial process for around 12 months. So I really want to find out about the moment that the bombshell dropped for you in relation to herpes. Can you tell me about what that experience was like for you? Mm, of course. So I was 25 years old. I had just gone through a big breakup in my life. And up until that point, I had only slept with boyfriends. I had, so I had very few sexual partners. Uh, prior to that, I'd been to a private prestige all girls school where there wasn't much educational information on sex or sexual health. Mm. So I really had no kind of information or education around what an STI was. And I had deemed myself as, as safe because I'd only slept with boyfriends. I had minimal sexual health partners, sexual partners. So I just believed that an STI wasn't something that would be on my radar. And I remember uh, leaving my partner and I'd slept with another man who was a friend who had also promised me that he was STI free. And I started to experience these really intense pains in my stomach. And I'm a very pro natural health person. I've been into fitness, Pilates, personal training for a really long time up until this point. So I was never very sick and I always had an aversion to going to the doctor. And I remember experiencing these intense pains and said to my girlfriend, like, I'm in so much pain. There's something wrong with me. By the time it came to Friday, I was in so much pain that I was like, I need to go to the doctor. And I went to a female doctor and I said to her, I'm experiencing these pains in my stomach. It's now um, causing me pain to urinate. And she turned around and she said to me, oh, let's just do a sexual health checkup, should we? And I turned around and said to her, no, 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 no. I only, I'm only, I only sleep with my partners. I wouldn't need to do a sexual health check. So she bed, she did whatever her routine STI check. And then she sat me down at her desk. She printed out an information sheet and she handed it to me and she goes, oh, honey, you test positive for herpes, you have herpes. And I didn't know what that was. So I was like, okay. Uh, just tell me what I need to take, tell me what injection it is, tell me what antibiotic it might be. And she said, oh, no, you don't get rid of this. And in that moment, I just remember thinking that my whole life was ruined. My life was over. I was now a really unattractive woman. I'd been through a big uh, journey of disordered eating up until this point. So I really had worked for a really long time on my physical appearance. And it was the only thing that I thought gave me worth. And I felt like the one thing that made me worthy had now been ripped from me. I felt like I ruined myself, that no man would ever love me again. And I remember thinking that life was over. Wow. That's quite a situation. I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes. And you must have really looked into the future and thought, that's it. Like, there is no future of any quality for me. Well, I was going through a traumatic breakup at the time. And I thought to myself, I would get through the breakup and eventually get over this heartache. And now to be presented with this stigmatized, stigmatized virus. And I really had this belief in my mind that I was the only woman in Australia that would test positive for it. I was thought to myself, I'll never fall in love again. I'll never experience love again. I'll never get married. Uh, I'll, I'll be alone. I'll be lonely for the rest of my life. I think that's a really big thing to highlight here. The belief that I'm unlovable when someone mm -hmm. gets this diagnosis that has still such a huge stigma that automatically people can completely wrongly believe that that makes them unlovable as a person, that love after that is just like a no-go. I'm unlovable mm -hmm. because I have this thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, in that moment, I created so many beliefs and so many stories. I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, I'm ruined, I'm disgusting, I've, my sex life is ruined. I created so many stories with no, no evidence to substantiate them, yet I believed them and they were my truth. And so I remember walking out of that doctor's office with all of those stories rolling around the back of my mind. Also the belief that I was alone in this. I was given no information about how common it is how easy it is to live with, how I can manage it through natural health, high quality drinking water, high quality foods, that I don't need to be on antivirals for the rest of my life, that people will still love you. There was no psychological support. So I walked out creating all of these stories and feeling like I had no one I could tell, no one I could share with, and that if anyone knew this about me, it might get out and the word would spread and people would know this about me. So I felt really alone and like I had to deal with this by myself and it was essentially me against the world.
Yeah, it's a really tough one because I think medical professionals are not really trained how to like to help people deal with the shame and, and help them understand that statistically most people have herpes like this is actually yes. just a thing that human gets if humans get like I've seen all sorts of stats but like 80% of people are supposed to have some sort of herpes but you know I've, I've seen even higher stats as well but um where did you go next? A uh, pharmacist was underneath the doctor's surgery so I went there for the medication that she prescribed me and then I went back to the man that I assumed had given it to me and I told him I like broke down on the floor crying and he looked quite shocked so he still to this day claims that he didn't know and maybe that's true because they say that 70 percent of people who do test positive for it don't show symptoms and it's not in a routine STI check but in that moment he reassured me that he loved me that he found me beautiful, that he would be here through this with me. And so I guess, and this is quite a common thing that ends up happening for a lot of women that have shared with me, that person then provides them the love that they feel like they won't get from the rest of the world. I felt that the rest of the world would reject me. And I had this man telling me how much he loved me, still saw me as beautiful and would accept me. So in that moment, I thought, well, this is my future. This man knows this thing about me. I'll never have to tell anyone else because I couldn't handle the shame of anyone knowing it about me. I'm going to stay with him where I'm safe. And I won't just won't have to deal with this. So I really went into that relationship and into a big denial process for around 12 months. Yeah. And that's a really hard situation for someone who's in an unhealthy relationship to feel that they must stay with a particular partner because no one else will want them is um, is really difficult territory for someone to end up in. I think it can end up quite toxic because for him, even though I feel out of fear that no one else would choose me so I was never choosing him I was choosing him because he chose me because of this thing so it creates it's not he's toxic and I'm toxic it's us together create a toxic and unhealthy environment and it won't create love it won't create even if for me my biggest pain for it was that I felt like I had been betrayed like my freedom of choice had been taken from me and so that I feel like once betrayal happens, it's really hard to come back from that. And so even if the potential, he was such a beautiful man, even if he had of maybe sat me down, honestly, face to face told me, I think I would have chosen him. But the fact that it was taken from me, I felt like my freedom was taken from me. My life was taken from me, my sensuality, my sexuality, my sexiness, my appearance. And I looked at him as you took this from me. You were the person that took it. And so I can never love you. And that creates a really unhealthy dynamic to build a relationship from. Mm. Very well explained. And I, I really like how you explain that because you're not blaming or anything. You're just kind of talking about the dynamic of those two people and the lack of control that you felt you had over your life, your relationship life, your love life, your sex life, like all of that in your mind had kind of been shattered and you were just in this situation of having to I say it from a much more grounded place now like eight years on I'm all about self-responsibility I can promise you eight years ago I was projecting and blaming I was like it was all of his fault so yeah. now eight years later after the fact the pain the trauma the heartache I don't believe the stories anymore it's very easy for me to take full responsibility and be able to look at it like that but I can promise you at the time the pain that I was in I just wanted to blame someone and I would look at him and blame him. And I would look at my ex-partner and blame him. But there was no, I felt like because I had asked, do you have an STI? And he'd promised me no. I felt like I'd done all the right things and that this awful thing had been done to me and it just wasn't my fault. So projecting and deflecting and hating other people and pointing fingers outwardly was my way to kind of avoid having to face off with myself. Yeah, I love the way you've painted the picture of the journey you've been on as well, that actually you can now step back from a situation and see it from like everyone's perspective. Um, whereas actually when you were in back in that stage, it was it was very different in relation to, to how you viewed things. So what happened next is I stayed in this relationship for 12 months. I, the first outbreak, um, I'm sure you've read, on, read up online or you would already know this, the first outbreak for any virus is really, is the worst one, the most extreme one that you'll ever have. So my first one was really horrific. Um, I don't often take medication. I'd take a Xanax, sleep for about a day and a half, wake up, take another Xanax and then do that for about up to six days. I pretty much slept through the pain because it was so extreme for me. And so I lived in fear that I just thought that that's what herpes was, that that extreme pain was going to come 
time and time and time again, one, two or three times a month on repeat. And I just uh, future fantasized what this awful reality was in store for me physically and emotionally. I was suicidal for the first 30 days. I did consider taking my life. And I do believe there would be suicide statistics attached to the virus. Mm -hmm. But I lived in fear and I waited for the virus to come back and it didn't. And so month one came, no outbreaks, month two, month three, month four, month five, month six, and it didn't come back. And that was quite a shock to me. I assumed that it would. And then I started drinking and partying. I was in like my party girl phase. I was 25 years old. And so I started drinking because uh, when I was out drinking and partying, the beautiful thing about that was my inner mean girl that was telling me, you're unlovable, you're ruined, you've ruined your life. Look, you're with this man that you don't even love, but you've got to stay with him because no man will choose you now. You've ruined yourself. You're never going to fall in love. She would speak so loudly, so prominently, so often all the time that when I was drunk or partying or taking recreational party drugs, that voice would silence. So for 24 to 36 hours, I could just be free and be myself and not have to worry about this inner mean girl that had told me I'd ruined my life. So I really started partying really quite hard on the weekends for about two years just to try and avoid the voice that was telling me that I was unworthy. I didn't want it to confront her. I didn't think she would ever disappear. And I felt like the only way to silence her was to party on the weekends to get rid of her and avoid, and just be normal. For 24 to 36 hours, I felt like I could just be normal and just be 25, 26, 27 again. And I, you know, I, I believe that I'm a very beautiful woman, so I'd be able to go out on at night time and receive attention and in the moments because I would be drunk or I would be taking recreational party drugs I could receive all the validation without receive without feeling the guilt of the oh but if they knew this thing about you they might not think and feel that way they might not say these things they might not be interested so I felt like I could freely be myself for that period of time and the guilt wouldn't set in until I was sober yeah, so you were really carrying this with, with you. Um, and it was a secret, right? No one else knew? No one knew at the time. So that part knew, and I knew it was between him and myself. Uh, the doctor that told me, I never went back to her because I didn't want anyone to know. So I never. I was just like, I don't even want this doctor to know it about me. I will say that she lied, that it was a false positive. She, no one ever has to find this out. And I lived with two best friends at the time, two females, and we told each other everything and it was the one thing I never told them because in the back of my mind I thought what if one day we have an argument what if one day we're drunk in a nightclub and one of them tells someone else and then they'll tell someone else and then all of Perth Western Australia will know this about me and to have anyone know it about you when you're when I was shaming myself so extremely it felt like the worst thing that could ever happen for someone else to know this about me the shame that you've just described there was just through the roof like this was really one of the highest degrees of shame that you could mm -hmm. really be feeling that you felt this illness defined you as a person mm -hmm. yeah and and a virus uh, really I consider it a virus of the mind because physically it wasn't impacting my life yeah physically and, and that was my biggest realization physically I was healthy strong fit beautiful like nothing changed except for the thoughts uh, that I held about myself because I was a carrier of this virus. And it's so crazy because if you have a cold sore, which is the same virus, you're not going, you know, you have it, like it goes away. You don't, it, you don't really change or people don't tend to change the way they feel about themselves as a person. Mm -hmm. It shows up from time to time and, you know, it goes away and they get on with their life. It's a bit inconvenient for a little while. And it's, it's really interesting that just because this is associated with genitals that the the shame that goes with that um and actually one of the things i heard about it was that actually it was only when the antiviral medication became available and then the companies wanted to promote this um big pharma wanted to promote this that actually they started to also kind of, kind of give this message of like herpes is this awful thing that you really need to be trying to get rid of and manage and 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 apparently that led into the stigma of course because it's as a money-making machine, people feel like they have to take medication to heal from this, which I believe that you can definitely manage it naturally if you're willing and dedicated to your own natural health to try and your mental health and your beliefs around manifestation if the, and fearing the virus. For as long as you fear the virus and fear that it will come, I believe that you're manifesting more of it. Of course, you're going to receive the outbreak because you're expecting it to arrive. But 
you know, uh, the only thing that I remember knowing about this virus was the jokes that I'd seen in movies, the jokes that I'd seen in TV shows and sitcoms, the jokes that I'd seen people make on social media, like, oh, herpes, you can only get it once, you can only catch it once. And I just thought it's the brunt of all jokes and now I am that joke. So I, I think that's most people may be very, very, very uneducated on it. A lot of people do, don't think it's this awful, terrible, bad thing that makes you diseased. I feel like the word, the, the D in STD is disease mongering and really there to Im, like, put fear into people. And so people genuinely do fear it, thinking it's something bad. And it's not until, I mean, I, I, I almost laugh now. I can't believe the mental prison that I lived in for so long. It was harder to live in silence. Uh, yes, I'm literally just putting myself in your shoes and thinking of this hell that, that you went through. And Beck, you touched on a really important point, which was about um, psychologically how this actually ends up becoming worse. Because when people are anxious and stressed, that this does suppress the immune system. And, um, and people are locally getting more informed about the links between our mind and, and how that impacts on our body. But if someone is actually living in so much shame and anxiety and depression over this illness, that actually is very likely to make the illness worse and, and that your immune system can't fight it so well. I, I believe that the symptom is a sign of the internal healing that is still left to do and mm -hmm. such a beautiful indicator of what's going on for us in our internal and external world and a beautiful teacher if we're willing to look at it as that. And we don't always, sometimes I definitely see that they play their part, but we don't always need to band-aid it with the antiviral to try and hide what's going on for us. And if we were willing to look at the symptom as a sign to the healing that we get to do within, we can really show ourselves that our body is talking and speaking to us. Mm, I really love that because it's sort of teaching women that like there's a lot of different ways that you can look at this and, and deal with it, but you don't have to go straight to modern medicine to try and hide it. But actually, you know, it's like if you have if you get cold sores, people don't really rush to like, you know, try every single day of their life to try and prevent it. And, and it's like even if you can just deal with the psychological stuff and and deal with the shame and like if, if people can overcome the shame, then there's less of a need to be trying to kind of suppress this virus um all of the time because i think that places so much stress on an individual oh yeah like i said i 100 percent think it's the vi a virus of the mind it is a yeah. i believe it's actually a mental health yeah. uh sti versus an actual physical condition mm -hmm. and the more energy and effort we can put into our internal and external world the more that the physical symptoms will lessen and the more it's just literally just going through what you've made this virus mean about you, what you think it's taken from you, why you believe that you were on the receiving end of it. And if you're willing to ask, like, for me, my greatest healing came in, what is it here to teach me? Yeah. And once I created a relationship with it and ownership and acceptance, and the thing around ownership and acceptance, some women say to me, I don't want to own it because I didn't get to choose getting it. I say 90 to 95% of people, it was a shock for them. Mm -hmm. And the ownership and acceptance, sometimes when it comes to forgiveness, ownership or acceptance, we think that that means if someone did wrong by us, we're making it okay. And I'm not saying if someone's done wrong by you, like my person telling me he was STI free when he wasn't, that doesn't make that okay. But I can't undo what's been done to me. But I can play really well with the cards that I've been dealt and really be willing to transform my pain into my personal power. Yeah. And there's no way that I can do that for as long as I'm resisting it. For as long as I resisted, or taking ownership and accept, accepting that herpes was now a part of me. I was facing resistance every day and emotional pain every single day. As soon as, as I decided line in the sand, I'm going to take my power back over the thoughts of what other people think of me, the thoughts of what I think about myself and what the, I've decided this virus means about me. That was the day my life changed. I really want to find out how you got there, Beck, because that must have been some journey. So let's um, let's talk about, um, so you were, you were really suffering. How long did that last for? Um, and what else did you experience before things started to change? I probably lived in extreme denial. While I started doing the self-worth work because I knew that, and I started on a, you know, inner deep dive journey because I knew that it was there but I wasn't willing to have the conversation about it. So I lived in denial for around four to five years. Mm -hmm. um, and I started 
at the same time that I test, tested positive for it, that was a time that I knew that everything that I'd worked for my entire life to try and make me worthy didn't work. Mm-hmm. And I'd done all the kind of typical things, start a business, get a good job, save lots of money, get a partner with wealth and status attached to him, work for the perfect Instagram body. And I thought that all of these things would make me happy. Mm-hmm. And none of them did. The day would come where I'd have the thing and the happiness didn't arrive. So when herpes came and it took what I thought was took everything from me, I decided I needed to look in different places Mm -hmm. because looking in all the places that I thought would bring me happiness did not bring me happiness. So I started on a deep dive self-discovery journey. I started doing workshops and mentorships and personal development and personal growth. And that was really the start of an eight year journey of self-education and self-discovery. Wow. And, you know, we live in society that kind of tells us to build stuff up in a very superficial way, the job, the money, the, you know, the Instagram followers or whatever it is that people perceive as like making worthy. And then if you take all of that away from someone or if something happens in someone's life um, and they they start to actually realize that all of that building stuff up um, in this very superficial way actually hasn't worked. So I really like that part of your story. You really have to like go inward quite deeply in order to to try and heal. My journey stemmed from being bullied in school and assaulted by a partner when I was 19. I was bullied by women, went to an all-girls school, and I attempted to take my own life when I was 14. And I was assaulted by my first partner when I was 19. And I didn't realize that I was running from that. I decided in those moments that that made me unworthy, just like the herpes virus. And so to try and feel worthy, I would work towards the things. And I would try so hard if I saved a certain amount of money, if I started a brand, if I lived in, like I lived front row on the beach, I believed if I lived in a beautiful home where everyone knew that I lived, if I drive, drove a big car, if I had, I used to work so hard for this perfect Instagram body, if I had the perfect body, I would then be worthy. People will like, love and accept me. And if they like, love and accept me, I'll be safe because then they won't hurt me. I kept working towards all of these things and the day would come that I would have the thing, but maybe I would experience like love and acceptance from the external world temporarily. But as soon as that was taken from me, it's like my whole world would crashed again because I didn't feel it from within. And so when the herpes virus arrived, I was like, I have literally worked for everything. None of it brought me what I thought it would bring. And now everything's been taken from me. It's time to look in a different place. And I was sitting on the beach and like essentially crying in breakdown, asking God, universe source, like why? Why me? Of all the women in Australia to to get this virus, why, why take it? Why give it to me? And I heard a voice saying to me, like, when are you going to start to listen? And you've tried to look externally your entire life for answers and you haven't found them. And the one place that you're avoiding day after day after day is looking within and looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. And that was when I really, and the voice then said to me, if you don't listen now, because the herpes virus is only small. And that was kind of my wager because I believed that voice. I was like, if I don't start doing the work and looking inwards at myself, the next wake up call will come and it will be much bigger and much more painful. And I was like, I'm not going there. And that's when I was like, it's time to do the work and it's time to look within at myself. I'm curious about the actual virus and how that played out. So um, in terms of outbreaks, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so just like I said, my first one was really horrific and super painful and I waited for it to come back and it didn't. So for me, outbreaks aren't something that occur for me. I had one last year. I opened my mobile phone. I'm very active on social media. And I had a group of women in America send me a lot of hate mail. Um, Hate mail. I woke up to a lot of nasty comments on my Instagram posts, some private messages of death threats, just some really mean words. And it was a really stressful moment for me. I had a day of experiencing such extreme stress. And the next day I had a little outbreak. Um, It was kind of like a, I would compare it to scratching myself. I thought I cut myself shaving. I lifted my leg up in the mirror to inspect it. And I realized, I'm like, oh my God, that's a herpes outbreak. Um, And in that moment, instead of shaming myself, because I now accept this part of me, I thought what a miracle our bodies are that my body was so stressed. Because for me, what I realized was my 14 year old who was bullied in school thought that the same thing was happening again. But now I'm 32 years old and it's just words on a mobile phone. And that same stress response of being attacked and assaulted at school created that physical response within my 32-year-old. And the next day, the outbreak came. 
Wow. In that moment, I just thought my body is a, is, a, is a miracle. It speaks to me. It speaks to me the work that still needs to be done. I still get to go and heal that inner 14-year-old that still think women are trying to bully her. And so that's been my experience with outbreaks. I believe that we can manage them naturally. Mm. I really do. It's, that's been my experience. I have the belief that I don't need medicine. And it's funny because I, I know that our words create our world. And I've always been, had this huge aversion to doctors and to, and to medicine ever since I was a child. If I was sick, I'd be like, no, mum, I'm healthy.